considered to be epic tales. Now the word epic is kind of uh, thrown around a lot in our day today, but in literature it had a specific meaning, especially as it applied to Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. Basically, an epic tale was one that involved an adventurer. He was a hero. He was larger than life and stronger, than, stronger and smarter than all that were around him, primarily because of the involvement of the gods in his life. And so an epic tale involved that kind of a hero, and his adventures extend for an extended period of time, and he does great works that are beyond human ability. And so that is epic. It is epic because his adventures take him upwards above the earth, and they take him downwards below the earth. And, uh, and therefore, he, uh, he goes on this adventure, and it is identified as being epic. As we come to Christ and we consider His work, we have the true epic work in Jesus Christ. He is the one who truly uh, exemplifies that which is epic. And we're going to see that as we go through our passage this morning. As we look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it, uh, Peter goes through this passage and he's continuing to encourage the believers in the way that they live. And he is going to identify the work of Jesus. Now, as we go through this passage, I'm going to read it. As we go through this passage, we will see some of the things that are typical of Christ's work, or what I mean is we are aware of them. And we're also go going to be introduced to some things, at least one, that is unusual or out of the ordinary that we don't normally think of when we consider the work of Christ. But Christ's work from beginning to end is kind of the outline or forms the outline for this passage. So please read with me as we look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says, For Christ also suffered, there's the first one, He suffered once for our sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death, that goes along with the suffering there, in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of filth from the flesh, but the answer of a, God, a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So in this passage, again, we have an outline of the work of Christ, starting with his suffering all the way to his exaltation into the right hand of God. And so we are going to look this morning, we're going to start to look at the epic work of Christ in our salvation. So the first point is that Jesus suffered. We see it in verse 18. It says, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now, we all know, and so the first thing I want to talk about concerning Jesus' suffering is that he suffered for sins. Now, we all know that. I mean, this is something that we hear over and over and over again. But it's something that we cannot forget because it is talking about the work of Christ against something that all of us had no ability to fight. We could not do anything against sin. We can try, we can strive, and we can try, and we can do the right things for a short period of time. But in the end, sin rules and, and has dominion over us. And no matter how hard we try, we cannot conquer it in our own strength. But Christ, He comes along and He does an amazing thing. He does something that only He could do in that He suffered for sins. There, we're going to be going through a number of passages this morning. I hope that you can turn really fast in your Bible or that you have a paper and a pencil. You can write them down. But uh, we're going to look at a number of verses. So the first one is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Talking about Christ, look what it says. Who Himself bore our sins in His own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. 
So what a great passage. It talks about Jesus bearing our sins. Now, from the beginning, there, God, I, I mean, God made Adam and Eve and He put them in the garden and things were all hunky-dory until they ate that fruit that looked so good to them. And uh, once they ate that, they just ruined it for them and they ruined it for everybody else. And uh, from that day, God required a sacrifice for sins. If you were going to be right with God, you had to take care of that sin problem. And so He instituted the sacrifices. And so in Leviticus chapter 5, verse 6, among other passages, we find what they had to do. In the Old Testament especially, it says, he shall bring this person shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin, which he has committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats, as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin. And so they sinned, and the sacrifice had to be made. And I tell you, um, we have the final sacrifice in Christ. That's what we're talking about this morning. But we still have the impact of sin that we have to deal with day in and day out. It has not gone away from our practical, everyday life. We still have to deal with it and deal with the consequences of it. How many times have we done something wrong? And it hurt us in some way. How many times do we face face a struggle or face a temptation or face a a dilemma in our our lives and, and we have to work our way through it and we have to struggle through it and we have to figure out even what we're supposed to do or not to do and it's just a it's just hard and it's a turmoil and it's a it's just a struggle. We battle, that's what the Bible talks us. Uh, tells us about sin. It is a battle that we have to fight. And so we fight through this. We fight against sin. And it has many impacts. Every time we deal with sickness, that is the result or a consequence of sin in the world. It may be because of my own personal sin that I get sick, or it may not be because of my own personal sin, but the fact that there is sickness is because there is sin in the world. And whether it's my fault or not, I still have to deal with it. All of us have been touched by this. All of us have to face up to this battle that uh, comes because of sin that has touched our health or the health of those that are around us, right? I mean, it's just unavoidable. We've all had to do that battle. Um, Sin impacts our relationships, We have trouble with the people around us. And they have trouble with us. We can't get along. And the reason we can't get along is because of the presence of sin in this world. And so we have to do that battle. And that is a battle that touches all of us. All of the time. We have to struggle. And we have to fight with it to make our relationships right. But it's it's a battle because of sin in the world. Our weaknesses and our inabilities, our failures and our shortcomings. We want to do this, but we can't seem to manage. And we want to have, uh, we want to be better and stronger and better looking and uh, uh, all of these things. We want that, but we can't seem to to line up with it. We have the ideal in our head, but uh, our bodies fail us, and it is because of sin. I've shared. I've shared this uh, before, but it it just uh, stands out as the kind of the first stark example in my own life that I was getting older, and I was 35 years old. So I was uh, teaching at the college and was playing soccer on the soccer field with the with the the college kids, and uh, and so the ball came in my direction, and in my mind things went one way, but the next thing I know, I'm laying on the ground, wondering what in the world happened. So in my mind, I had it all squared away, but in my body, it was weak, and it was uh, just off. And we have to deal with that. Uh, Every inability to reason or to think or to be strong enough or, or handle our emotions rightly, all of those reflect the weakness in this world and in ourselves because of the presence of sin. We have to do battle against it. Romans chapter 7 Verses 23 through 25 are, are some great verses here. The end of Romans chapter 7 really uh, 
uh, expresses this conflict, this challenge that we have, that I want to do what is right, but I inevitably do what is wrong. It just, it just kind of expresses this. And so some of these verses say this. It says, I see another law in my members, and here's an important word, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. And, and here is the good part. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? From this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And there we have our first glimmer of hope in our battle against sin. So we have all of these things going on in the world around us. And all of these uh, battles that we fight against. And we can strive and we can fight and we can do our best against them all, but we really cannot hope to overcome except when we turn to Jesus. Only when we turn to Jesus can we have the hope of victory. And praise the Lord, He has invited us to go along with Him and to be on His side. And He has promised that He would be with us and that He would go before us and take care of our sin problem. Praise the Lord for that. And so I have hope for tomorrow because Jesus has called me and I am His child. And He loves me. Praise the Lord for that. It is only in Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14 says, in whom, that's Jesus, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. So our victory is in Jesus. Our hope is in Jesus. And I implore you today, if you do not know Jesus Christ this morning, that your only hope in the battle against sin is by accepting Him into your life, asking Him to forgive you, and going forth with Him from this moment on. That is the only hope. If you don't go along with Jesus, you will continue to struggle and you will continue to strive against the impact of sin in your lives. And in the end, you will die. And you will go to hell conquered by sin instead of victorious over sin. And so come to Jesus if you have not already. Ask Him to forgive you. He has given His blood for your redemption. Will you receive Him into your life? I hope that you will. Not only did Jesus suffer for sins, but He suffered once. He suffered once. In the Old Testament, they had to offer their sin offerings repeatedly. As a matter of fact, if you were going to be a godly Jewish person, mindful of worshiping God, you probably had to move near Jerusalem and you probably had to have come into a lot of wealth because you would have had to, or had your own flocks or whatever, um, because you would have had to, every time you sinned, take that animal and go make a sacrifice for yourself. It was something that had to be redone repeatedly, time after time after time after time. It was an expensive proposition. It was a bloody proposition. And it was meant to show that sin was serious. After all, one of your, your best animals in your flock had to die because of what you had done. And so it was meant to be impactful and it was meant to be repeated. But Jesus, when He came, He died and gave His life once. Only once. Because the impact of His blood and the, 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 the strength, if I'm just going to use that word, the strength of His blood was so powerful and so overwhelming that when He gave His life and when His blood was shed, sin was absolutely destroyed once and for all. And so there is this forgiveness that comes by the blood of Jesus after His one offering on the cross for our sins. He did it once, and therefore we come to Him, and one time it is all taken care of. Praise be to the Lord. When we consider Jesus in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, 
It says, this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. The, the picture that is conveyed here is to be so overwhelming and so impactful, even more so than the repeated animal sacrifices that had to be made. Jesus came once. He died once. He, uh, he um, uh, gave his sins, his sacrifice for his sin forever. And then he sat down. The work was done. And that's the end of the story. There is no adjusting it. There is no altering it. There is no need to do anything else. Jesus has taken care of it once and for all. And in such a powerful way that we can look only to Him and know that the victory has been won once and for all. Now, I love this. In this verse, it says, He offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Now, why is that important for me? Because it means that all of my sins, past, present, and future, have been taken care of. That's why we say that when Jesus died for our sins, He didn't only die for the things that I have done in the past. He died for the things I am struggling with today. And He died for the things that I will face tomorrow. That is is a only possible by a God who knows the past and the future and the present and He knows the end from the beginning. He knows it all and He can do this. Only He can do this. And so He brings comfort to us. Now listen, we don't have to carry the guilt of our past failures anymore. This is a big thing. It is a, this is huge in our relationships. Because, you know, things are going along, you know, between a husband and a wife, between Christina and I, things are going just really great. And then all of a sudden she says a bad word like she just tends to do every week. You know, just, no, I'm just kidding. Just, or the other way around, I'm embarrassing her now. But um, as soon as we get into a tizzy, you know what happens? The closet doors get flung open and all of the stuff of the past come out of the closet. I'm going to use every weapon available to me to win my battle with her. We cannot forget so often what has gone in the past. Try having an argument with that special other person of yours without reminding them of something in the past. Try try to do that. (laughs) All right. The point is this. A lot of times we, will, we are hindered in our service to God because we're immobilized by our sins in the past. And if Jesus died for my sins in the past, if He has removed them from me, why do I keep bringing them up? Why do I keep making, using them as an excuse? Well, you know, God can't use me because I did this or I'm like this. And, and um, Basically, the truth is we can't forgive ourselves. We are holding on to the sins. And we are guilty because of the sins. And they keep coming up before God. The sins of the past. But Jesus died for them. There is no need to remember them anymore. You have been forgiven. Do not carry the guilt from the past any longer. We struggle with sin in the present. We are to repent so that we are delivered. But we still struggle with our sin right now. But Jesus has died for the sins that we are dealing with right now. Yes, we should strive against them. And yes, it's a battle. And yes, it's a warfare. And, uh, and yes, there's tension there. But He has died for your struggles. He has already died for them. Believe that He has done that. And go forward and serve Him. I, I remember the politician, somebody was running for office, this was years and years and years ago, and I don't remember who it was, but I remember what he said. Because there was something in his past, I think it had to do with the relationship with his wife or with somebody else, or I don't know what, it was something like that. And somebody brought it up as, you know, all good uh, politicians, you know, get all, everything brought up out of, uh, that's possible there. Anyways, they brought it up, he was a Christian, and, and um, they threw it against him. They threw it against him, tried to use it against him. And I remember his response. He says, that's why I'm a Christian. Jesus died for all of my sins and my failures. 
and uh, he has taken care of that, and I am free to move on with my life. And, and that was just a great disarming of a failure in his past. He acknowledged the failure, and he gave testimony to Christ for having forgiven him and enabling him to go on with his life. And that's what Jesus does for us. Um, we can go on with our lives because He died for our sins. He has died for our future sins. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but He does. He is already there, if you will. He already sees it. He knows it. He knows everything that's going to happen to us tomorrow. He knows all of our failures. He knows every time we are going to yield to sin. He knows it, and He has already taken care of it. We can go forward with confidence in His grace and mercy. We can go forward in life knowing that He has already been there and He knows all about it and He will help us through and He has forgiven us of it all. We can trust in Jesus. Here are some great verses and I would encourage you if you struggle with sins coming up over and over again, I would encourage you to make note of some of these verses here. The first one is Isaiah 43.25. I, even I, am He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. If He doesn't remember them, we should not remember them. And notice also, you know, we tend, we're really selfish and self-centered people. We just really are. Notice he says, I will blot out your transgressions for my sake. Um, there's something much bigger than us going on here. And God has done an amazing thing, not only for me, but for the entire universe, for the entire creation. And that's why the work of Christ is so epic. It is not just about me and my eternal life. Praise the Lord, I'm included in that but it is much bigger than me. And so, He will forgive our sins for His name's sake. He will remember them no more. The next verse, another great verse, Isaiah 38, 17. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness, but you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Now, I love this. It's like, you know, we're walking, we're walking with Him and we're saying, but Jesus, but Jesus, and in our arms are all our failures. But Jesus, but Jesus. And He, and he, he just kind of takes them up and throws them behind Him. And we go on with Him. He has done that he has lovingly delivered, lovingly delivered our soul from the pit of corruption. He has thrown our sins behind His back. And He doesn't turn around to look. He just chucks them behind Him. A great verse there. Here's another one. Micah chapter 7, verse 19. Hey, Micah, if you're in here somewhere, here's a great verse from a book that's called, that's, uh, that you're named after, I guess. <laughs> He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Now there's two, there's two great parts to this verse. First of all, He will subdue our iniquities. That's like He just squashes them to nothing. Isn't that great? It's like they're so big to us. What He does, it's like the little roach on the ground. Gone. That's what he does. Did I tell you about the roach that was eating popcorn one night? I come out, it's the middle of the night, I come out of the bedroom, and I hear this little crunching sound. It's coming from the kitchen. What in the world? It's the middle of the night, everything's dark. I thought maybe Christina got up to have a snack of popcorn or something. She loves popcorn. I turn on the light, and underneath the table, it's, um, this was when we were in Florida, those big palmetto bug. He's perched on top of a piece of popcorn, just chowing away at it. I was like, what in the world is going on here? But that's, uh, um, our sin is like that roach. 
and he stomps on it, and it is subdued, defeated. It is him taking all of our sins into his arms and putting a ball and chain on them and throwing them into the deep, deepest sea. That's what he does to our sins. Now, why do we get in the submarine and go down looking for it and trying to bring it back up to the surface? Why do we do that? We should not. He has cast them in there for a reason. Let us forget our sins. Let us give praise to the Lord for His mercy and His goodness. He has forgiven us. Praise be to Him. And then the last verse here, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus. It cleanses us from all sins. Our next point, Jesus suffered for sins. Jesus suffered once. Jesus suffered the just for the unjust. Now we know about us, right? This is us right here. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is us. We are unjust. It doesn't matter how moral we are. There are a lot of good people in this world, right? I mean, you can just, you can look across the street and you can look at your neighbors and some of your co-workers and there are a lot of good people. There are a lot of moral people. But before God, we are unjust. All of us. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus, He is the one who knew no sin. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. He, God the Father, made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. He has done such a great work for us. The One who knew no sin took all of the sin upon Himself. Only God could have done that. He took all of our sin upon Himself. Oh Lord, have mercy. Every time I sin, I am causing His his grief. And I am a partaker of His death. Every time I sin, we should not sin so lightly. Lord, have mercy on us. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Our next point, Jesus suffered, and this is great here. This is is all from 1 Peter 3.18. Jesus suffered to bring us to God. He suffered to bring us to God. This is great. We had no way to get to heaven. We had no way. There is no way under the sun for a man to get to heaven in his own strength. None. None. It's hopeless. We, we can't even get uh, you know, off of the ground for very long. He died. He suffered to bring us to God. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 says, We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for Him. And that, that right there is powerful. It was fitting for Him. In other words, it was appropriate for Him to do this. Why? Because for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. He did it for us. He left His glory in heaven and became like us. He humbled Himself and became like us. And He suffered death on our behalf. He tasted death for us. And it was fitting for Him to do this because He made all things and all things are for Him. It's sort of like that, uh, I don't know, that car out there that you love so much is wrecked and you go to it and you fix it up. It's yours. And you make it, you restore it back to what it should be. Well, here's all of His creation that has gone astray because of sin. And He came to fix it. To do away with sin and to bring salvation back to us. 
The last point here, Jesus suffered being put to death in the flesh. Being put to death in the flesh. Now, again, we know, we know about this, but there's something else that I want us to see here from Philippians. So, he was put to death in the flesh. It says in, first, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, it says this, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. So that was a, that was a humbling experience for him. It was a humility for him to die. The creator of the universe, to die. That was an act of humility. Even the death of the cross. So this is what he did. Right? That is his work. And we know about that. But let's look at the next part, beginning in verse 9. It says, therefore, therefore, as a result of his humility, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that in the name of Je- at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now here's the thing. And this is why this is so epic. What Jesus has done is epic. Because it is not just me who will bow my knee to Him and say, praise be to the Lord. I am going to do that willingly. But Jesus is not just the victor of sin in my life. He is the victor over sin in all of creation. Every knee will bow of those in heaven, of those on the earth, and of those under the earth. Every knee in all of creation, every living thing, those for him, those against him, the angels, the demons, they will all bow the knee and give glory to God. We, I hope, will give it willingly. They will have to. Because He has conquered them. Jesus has suffered for our sin. We have received a great victory that is epic in its scope. So let us give praise to the Lord for what He has done in our lives. And I'll tell you what, it gets better from here. We've just talked about His suffering, but there are all these other things that he has done as well. As we come to our invitation time this morning, if you are here and you are struggling with sin in your life, maybe it is a sin in your past that just keeps on haunting you and weighing you down. Maybe it is a sin that you are dealing with right now that you can't seem to gain a victory over. Now, I can't say, I can't ask you if you're struggling with a sin that you're going to struggle with tomorrow because, you know, none of us are there yet. But we can deal with the things that we're dealing with now and the things that have happened in the past. If there is some kind of sin that you are struggling with, either past or present, and you can't seem to get a victory over it, we're going to have a, a chance to pray for that now. So let's stand. We're we're going to have a time of prayer, but uh, Ben's going to pray in the background, and then we will sing. So let's stand, and let's go to the Lord in prayer.